In a recent survey of Americans, they were asked which superpower they would most like to have. And the winner was mind reading. Actually, it was tied with time travel, but it was right there at the top of the list as the most desired superpower. And the thing that's interesting about mind reading as a superpower is that it's actually somewhat within our grasp as humans, unlike time travel or x-ray vision or being able to shoot spider webs from your wrist. Now, I'm not talking about a woo-woo skill that you might encounter at the Eugene Saturday Market where a psychic is claiming to read your mind. Instead, I'm talking about something much more mundane. How accurate are we at guessing what other people are thinking? And what we think they're thinking, is that what they would say they're thinking? Um, as it turns out, we mere mortals are actually routinely better, at, better than chance at doing this, at reading other people's thoughts. Now, how do we achieve this superpower? Again, if we were looking at Ben's superheroes, we would just simply read the thought bubble above their heads. So here, Beetle thinks he'll slough off for the day, but Sarge knows what he's going to do by reading his thought balloon. Alas, there are no thought balloons in real life. <laughs> and unfortunately, the latest model of Homo sapiens does not equip with any kind of thought receptors for reading other people's thoughts. So perhaps it's better to think about constructing other people's thoughts rather than reading their thoughts. Because I think reading gives us the mistaken impression that there's actually something we can directly access and read. Fortunately, we're going to get some help with this elaborate construction project. Now, we can't read people's thoughts directly, but we can read their body language. And it turns out that people's facial expressions and other bodily expressions of emotion are very important in knowing what they're thinking. But knowing what emotion someone's thinking is not going to really let you know, sorry, well, if you know what emotion someone's feeling, it's not going to let you know what they're thinking. The same goes for ducks. So the duck here is clearly upset by something. He's got his head in his hands. He's down on the floor. He's crawled underneath the desk. There are books everywhere, including some that are being tossed in the air. What's going on? Is his psychology homework too hard? Is it the fact that he has a term paper due in 20 minutes and there's a pep rally tonight? Or given that this picture came from a site on Oregon's earthquake preparedness, perhaps he's just trying to stay out of harm's way. Now, granted, reading the duck's emotions are more of a challenge than reading the average person, because you may have noticed his mouth never moves, and he has no eyelids. <laughs> However, even when we have fully functioning, fully expressive human beings, um, it can be hard uh, to, to read. And it turns out that actually it's the verbal cues that other people give us, not the nonverbal cues that, is, that are most important in understanding what they're thinking. So what people tell us is going to be a valuable cue to what they're thinking. Now, in addition to these verbal cues, we also have knowledge about a particular person, about an individual that's going to help us to know what they're thinking. In this picture here, you don't even have to see Chip's face to know that he's probably thinking something along the lines of, I hope this ends soon. Now, how do we know that? We know a little bit about Chip Kelly. He's not kind of a snuggles and hug, you know, huggy kind of guy. And what's more, the person that he's being hugged by here is Steve Sarkeesian, the UW football coach, one of his biggest rivals. So even if we don't know anything about a person, we can use our general knowledge of what we know about human beings in general to understand what they're thinking. But you can imagine the duck in this circumstance, just like anyone else, is probably thinking, gee, this is kind of fun, but I sure hope they don't drop me. So I'm going to tell you about three things today uh, from psychology research that answer the question, just how good are we at reading other people's minds, and what would make us better at mind reading? And the three things I'll tell you about, I think they all have a little bit of an element of surprise. All right, first off, gender differences. You tell me, who's better at reading other people's minds, men or women? All right, no surprises there. Um, <laughs> confident enough to put my cartoon in there. Uh, we have a woman here. She's reading this guy's mind. And I think this really perpetuates the strong belief that women are not only better mind readers, but that men are somewhat flummoxed and cowed by women's ability to do this. Um, all right. Several studies have indeed shown that women are better mind readers than men. But the surprise is that there are a number of studies that show that there is no difference between men and women. Or as my lab has summarized it, uh, Women are sometimes better than men, sometimes they're not, but men are never better than women. <laughs> Why do women show this sometimes advantage? Why do they only show the advantage some of the time? We think it's because there may be gender-specific ways of motivating women to, to be more accurate at reading other people's minds. It's like anything that reminds women, oh yeah, we're the gender that's supposed to care, 
makes them more accurate at reading other people's minds. So for example, if you ask women first how much sympathy or compassion they feel for another person, they'll be better at reading that, that person's thoughts. Um, if you give men that same nudge, it doesn't have any effect. Similarly, if you challenge women's superiority at this skill, so if you say to them, you know that stuff about women being more interpersonally sensitive? You know there's been some new research that suggests that's not right. Women will rise to the challenge and they will perform better. Now these two findings, however, don't mean that you can't motivate men to be more, uh, to be better mind readers. Um, we just need to find equal opportunity motivators, things that work on both men and women, like money. Um, we did a study here in Oregon and we told people we'd pay them according to how accurate they were at reading other people's thoughts. And it turns out that everybody got a little bit more sensitive when they were giving money to motivate them. And the gap between men's and women's performance closed right up. All right. Next up, Everybody also knows that if you've had some ex personal experience with a life event, um, you'll be better at understanding the thoughts of someone else who's going through that same life event. So you know new mothers think they understand other new mothers better. College students with divorced parents believe that they'll understand better what other college students or uh, parents who are divorced are, are thinking. Except the problem is we've never found any evidence for this in our studies of, of, of mind reading accuracy. We've found no evidence for the experience advantage. And the experiences that I mentioned, um, being the mother of a new child, having your parents be divorced, and actually being a recovering alcoholic, those are the experiences we've used in our studies. And the people who've had those experiences were actually no better at guessing the thoughts of other people who are, had those experiences than people who'd never had that experience. Here's an example of some of our data from uh, the, the study using parental divorce. And what you're seeing here is uh, the bars represent how accurate the people, uh, participants in our studies were at guessing other people's thoughts. And if they'd had the experience of parental divorce, they were no better at guessing the thoughts than if they had never been through that experience. Um, and we've seen the same null result with no difference between the two groups now in, in several studies. At this point, you're probably wondering, well, how exactly do they measure that? And in the divorce study, what we did, we had pairs of college students come in in this study. Those were our participants. And in those pairs, there was always at least one student who had divorced parents. They come into our lab, they talk about how they think divorce affects kids growing up, and we videotape them while they have that conversation. After that's done, they go back and watch the videotape, and we ask them to report the thoughts that they had while they had the conversation. And we also ask them the exact time that they had those thoughts. So for example, the guy on the left here might have been thinking during this conversation as he thought about his own parents' divorce, I hated having to go back and forth between two houses. Then we show the videotape to the other participant, and we stop it at the same points where the first participant reported having a thought. And we say, OK, yes, what was he thinking right there? She might report something like, he's thinking about how it was hard not to have his dad around. And then we code how accurate that guess is. How close does that guess match what the first participant actually said he was thinking? Now in this case, she's not particularly accurate, but you can see she's not totally off either. Now that gives us this objective measure of accuracy. But it turns out that accuracy might not be everything. It may, that may not be all that there is. I think all of us can probably think of a time when we had the perception that somebody was understanding us, um, but maybe it was only a perception, and they really weren't that accurate. Like this cat here who's giving an excellent uh, perception of being understanding, but is really feigning it. Um, and the one thing that seems to help create that perception of understanding is when someone tells us they've had a similar experience to ours. Now we saw this in one of our studies. In this study, when we had new mothers and they were responding to the experiences of other new mothers, and they were perceived by those other mothers as being more understanding, but only if they mentioned, oh, I'm like you, I'm a new mom too. If they didn't mention the experience, they're not seen as being as understanding. We also ran a kind of sneaky study back with our college students in the experience of divorce, and we led college students who had divorced parents to believe that they were talking with someone else who also had divorced parents or we led them to believe that they were talking with someone else who didn't have divorced parents. And then we asked them for their perceptions. How understanding was the person you talked with today? Um, if they believed that the other person had had shared experience, this is the bright yellow bar, then they rated them as being more understanding than if they didn't believe that the other person had that shared experience. Now this is in contrast to whether or not the person had actually had the experience of being divorced or not. Here you see that whether or not the person they were speaking with had really had divorced parents or not, had no effect on how understanding they were perceived to be. But why doesn't our personal experience make us more understanding or make us more accurate at guessing other people's thoughts? It seems like if we've been there too, then we should be better at reading others' thoughts on similar matters. But maybe our own experience comes with some baggage. 
we may assume that our own experience is exactly like the other person's and that our own thoughts on the matter are exactly the same. Essentially, we're projecting from our own experience onto theirs. Now, projection doesn't necessarily hurt my ability to know what somebody else is thinking, but it doesn't necessarily help either. If I didn't have my own experience to rely on, what I might be forced to do is to use my general knowledge of what we know about human beings generally. And that leads me to the third thing, um, I think the surprising thing that affects people's accuracy at knowing other people's thoughts. Now, new motherhood, parental divorce, becoming, being a recovering alcoholic, these are all very, very different life experiences. But the thing that they share is that they're all experiences that the average person knows something about. So in other words, we have a stereotype for what it's like to have a new baby or what it's like to overcome an addiction to alcohol. Now, usually when we use the word stereotype, we think about applying that to groups of people. And in this case, we're using it to a type of experience. Um, and you think, well, where do, these where do these stereotypes of experience come from? They come from places like our friends and neighbors, the evening news, from movies we go to, the novels we read, those after-school specials we used to watch on TV. And those give us an idea. So you all can help me out here. You can tell me, what's a stereotypic thing that a new mother might be thinking? What do new moms think? I want sleep. I, want sleep. I sure am tired. My baby's awfully cute. I wish I had more time for my, hu my husband. And we found, and we've looked at this now in the studies with the new motherhood and also with the parental divorce, that when people make more stereotypic guesses about what other people are thinking, they're more accurate. Um, what you're seeing here is a regression line, and it shows that the participants that made more stereotypic guesses about new mothers, so in other words, guessed that they were thinking things like they were tired, um, were more accurate. The more those guesses had stereotypic content, the more likely these participants were accurate. Now, this is a counterintuitive finding. Instead of paying careful, close attention to an individual to guess what he or she is thinking, it's like we're applying this one-size-fits-all stereotype. But again, if we were to try and take that careful attention approach, the problem is what exactly would you be paying careful attention to? Remember, there are no thought receptors that we can directly access other people's thoughts. So we resort to stereotypes, and we use this generalized knowledge of what we know about human experience, and kind of remarkably, it works. It makes us more accurate at guessing other people's thoughts. Now, three things to keep in mind about this strategy of using stereotypes. First of all, one of the main reasons why stereotypes work in this case is because there are common features to this, these experiences. Um, new mothers are generally tired, and college students generally are kind of upset when their divorced parents start dating or remarrying. And if these experiences didn't have these common features, or other people didn't know what those common features were, we wouldn't expect the stereotypes to lead to greater accuracy. The second thing is that uh, people in these studies were not necessarily trying to use their stereotypes, and they may not have even been aware that this was a strategy they were using. We simply measured the extent to which they uh, had stereotypic content in their, in their inferences and in their guesses and that, how that led to accuracy. We didn't tell people, use your stereotypes. And in fact, we think if we had given those explicit instructions, it may have messed them up. And last thing, and you'll just have to trust me on this because I'm a psychologist, you probably shouldn't tell people, oh, I know exactly what you're thinking because I know what the stereotypic average new mother, college student with divorced parents, recovering <coughs> alcoholic, um, is feeling. Um, it's almost never nice to be on the receiving end of a stereotype, even if it's just one for experiences and even if it's one that has some accuracy to it. Um, we just don't like it when other people assume we're like everyone else. And back to the distinction I made earlier between accuracy and perceived understanding, uh, the stereotypes might make you more accurate, but if you tell everybody that's what you're doing, you probably won't be perceived as very understanding. All right, so now you know a little bit more about mind reading. You know that uh, sometimes women have an advantage over men, and when they do, it's probably because there are special ways of motivating women. Uh, you know that shared experiences will not make you a, a better mind reader, a more accurate mind reader. However, it might make you be perceived as more understanding, particularly if you remember to mention that you've had the experience. And when it comes to understanding others, using general knowledge about common features of certain life experiences, it's likely to make us more accurate mind readers. So the next time you're feeling a little down, just remember that you, as a regular human being, are endowed with a touch of a superpower when it comes to reading between the minds. Thank you.